So, um, all right. Wait. Oh, shit. Forgot to do something. Uh, today's yep. episode is brought to you by our good friends at Chubby's. I knew I had to do something, and this is very important because Chubby's is very important. It's a very important to me. It's very important to Kate. Very important to Cons, especially Cons, because he has that caboose that looks absolutely delightful whenever he wears Chubby's. Um, I gotta say too. Yeah, quarter zips. I love everyone looks oh, good yeah. in a quarter zip. They do. Everyone. And I just got a new flannel from them. So comfy. You yeah, have a good flannel. They're too. not just shorts oh. anymore. I remember when I first discovered them, they were just the shorts guys. They've expanded beyond that, and everything they've made is unbelievable. So that's exactly right because Chubby's is the home of the ultimate cozy comfort clothes that'll keep you feeling warm and good looking as the weather gets progressively worse and worse. From flannel line shorts to their warm pullover to their quarter zips, Chubby's has the all fall ready threads for outdoor football game, pumpkin patch adventures, or doing a little bit of apple picking with cons and his children, child. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, when others are seeing you sporting chubbies in the world, they're bound to say, oh, wow, that person is wearing chubbies. I'm going to do that. You give them the, it's like the Jeep wave, you give them the chubby rubby. <laughs> chubby I mean, rubby. With consent. Yep. <laughs> and I okay. have respect for them. I think they're cool this fall. Uh, elevate your style, your confidence. And your entire fundamental being with Chubby's for a limited time. Chubby's is giving our listeners 20% off Ooh. of your order with the exclusive code. Use code ZB30 at chubbyshorts.com. Again, go to ZB30 at chubbyshorts.com. Welcome back to another edition of Zero Blog 30. Today, we are going to have a very special guest. I'm excited about this guest today. Do you know who it is? meteorologist kate barstool <laughs> that's exactly right Morning katie weather's here mm -hmm. yeah hurricane zbt rolling <laughs> that's through. exactly right because who better to talk about weather than us it's me we all have weather apps we do we have weather apps and i don't I, know science how many weather apps i would you say have, this is a dad I, test you've been a dad for like a year and a half now yeah a little how many weather apps do you have i i have two i have oh. the standard weather app i learned that that gets fed by one of the other weather apps I had. So I deleted that. So I have just the standard Apple weather app. And then I also have AccuWeather. No free ads. Okay. Kate? I only, I just have the basic one that comes on my iPhone. But I love when, when you're in an office and the weather bug alert. Remember the weather bug? Uh, uh, that's one of mine that I have. And everyone is all of a sudden in a flutter. It's like, what's happening? A big rain's coming. Ooh, yeah, it's very I have, exciting. I have some special weather apps. Hmm. I have... Weather bug that you already mentioned, yeah. AccuWeather, which I think is the most accurate of them all. Uh -huh. I have Weather Underground. Oh, yeah, the Weather Channel app, and just the regular old Apple Weather. But I have a sixth one that's kind of like the fifth sa safety rule that's undefined. Our old producer Kyle, because Kyle, oh, yeah, he's he, a weather guy. Kyle's a huge weather guy. <laughs> he's got like instruments in his yard. He's got like he? his own Doppler shit. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I uh, whenever that hurricane that we're gonna talk that came through North Carolina about two weeks ago now, mm -hmm. um, whenever we, he, whenever it was coming because he lives in North Carolina, mm -hmm. lives like pretty pretty close, like about forty five miles from where everything went down, maybe a little bit further than that. But I was like, "Are you good?" He's like, "I got everything up and running. I, I don't think we're gonna get that much." And he was pretty correct in yeah. how much he predicted that they were gonna get and how much they got. Yeah, weather I, guy, big I time would, dad I, move. I would. Trust Kyle. If I had to pick people for a deserted island, who I'm sorry, I think I'd, Kyle would be one of my picks. He's, he's a, a fantastic guy who knows choice. Things. He's yeah. a Leatherman. Yeah. He's a Leatherman as a person. He knows what's up. He, yeah. Like anyway. if you need to open up a bottle, he's your guy. Swiss Army knife of a guy. Yeah. He's got some stabbing materials. Yep. He's got some stuff that if you got a big old splinter, he can yep. pick it out. But the real guest today is Donnie. Because you have a big announcement coming oh, up. Oh, no, I don't know if he's going to come on or oh, not. Oh, never mind. Just <laughs> but, kidding. Just yeah, kidding. <laughs> I do want to talk about it at the top of the show. I'm very excited. Me and Donnie does, if you've been following Barstool for a while. Our travel guy. He's the travel guy. Lived in China for a long time. Been to over 70-something countries. And he is going to be having a baby. So we are going to start. It doesn't really have anything to do with him starting baby. Just no. do that in there. Because yeah, I, like I was babies. wondering why you uh, yeah. mentioned that. <laughs> yeah, he's going to be a dad too. To start you know what show. happens when you have a baby, you start another podcast. Too. Yeah, yeah exactly. Just add right. to your workload. That's the way to do it. That's yeah. exactly right. But what's it called? So me and Donnie are starting a show. It's called Drop a Pin. And the premise is going to be, it's going to be like a podcast travel show. Uh, but it's going to be talking with a lot of his friends and like fellow t content creators that have done travel stuff and have gone abroad a bunch. 
like our first episode. And I promise it's not going to be heavy. Like we do a lot of heavy news on ZBT, but we're going to do a little bit less there. Not on the first episode, though. The Mm -hmm. first episode, we interview a guy named Sam who's been to all 193 countries in the world. Yep. Every single one. And on one of his last ones, it was like 170 something. He went to Syria, got captured after he had been in the country for two hours, standing on the side of the street. And there was a whole thing of people coming out, ski masks, guns, grabbing him, throwing him in there. He didn't know where he was going to go. Ended up being like in an underground prison where he didn't speak to anybody who spoke English for at least six weeks. Mm -hmm. He's not exactly sure still. But we talked to him about his story, and then we get into Syria. We also talk about, and then one of the other upcoming episodes, Donnie's trip to the Yucatan yeah, and Mexico, where he went on um, a guided mushroom tour with with the person who's grant it was the grandson of the person who started the psilocybin mushrooms in the United in North America and really all over the world 130 years ago. And so that story is fascinating. We talked to a dude who's like a shaman. He's trying to get me to go get, exercise yeah. my demon. So it's just a very it's it's super fun. Yeah. And then we're going to do little stories like uh, Nick and KB are going to come in and talk about Wheeling, West Virginia. So it's going to be anywhere in the world. The show is called Drop a Pin. It comes out on Monday. So make sure that you go subscribe there. It's going to be hosted on his YouTube channel, which is mm-hmm. called Donnie Does um, the Wonton Don. If you type any of those into the YouTube search bar, it'll come up right away. Um, if you want to get an idea of who Donnie is, if you just listen to ZBT and you're not exposed to a whole lot of other Barstool stuff, he ha- he does a um, documentary, I think it's pinned to the top, on the mole people in Vegas. It's mm. fast. It's got millions and millions of views. Yeah, I think it's, it's the got like 20 million views or the something The underground like mole that. people who live in the sewers of Vegas. And he does, he does his travel in like a kind, compassionate, not exploitative kind of way. Yeah. Even the mole people in Vegas, it's not like, oh my God, look at this. It's like really fascinating and well done. And he's one of those people who can just fit in wherever he goes. He's just so cool as a cucumber and I think, just a cool dude. I think a word that describes Donnie to me, it, well, two, would be adventurous and curious. Yes. I was thinking I, curious. I was thinking that there's yeah. one word. It's just he has a curiosity about him that really shines through in everything that he does. And to your point, Kate, that's what made me think of it is it's never exploitative and it's always just very fascinating. Yeah, I can see. I picture being in a firefight with him in the middle of Afghanistan and him looking over calmly and being like, so so why are they doing what they're doing over there? You know, like, why? Yeah. That's very calm. And he's just, a, he's just a yeah. guy with good vibes. Like, we yeah, went to... <laughs> Me and a couple other guys here and some of my neighbor bros, we went to Sturgill Simpson concert on last week. It was like last Tuesday or Wednesday, something like that. And I look over and me and Donnie had met up with somebody and the dude hands Donnie some mushrooms and Donnie takes like a handful of mushrooms and he we go to the concert together. And this dude is with me and my like three or four of my neighbor buddies, all very different from Barstool Vibes people. Yeah. And Donnie's just having the greatest time dancing around he's actually like i i think he it's going to be good for me like his like i think our relationship is going to be good for me yeah because he is so out there like tomorrow we're doing a trip or whenever you're listening in the morning wednesday i guess we're gonna go do a live search for some crab brand goons so i'm excited <laughs> okay. to do that on his youtube channel there um anyways i'm excited the about the show episode? on october 14th and it, again it's called drop a pen Awesome. And if you listen, I know this podcast, we haven't called you in a, while, a long time, baby girls. Oh, yeah. But drop a pin, listeners, the pinheads. Yeah. Absolutely. Oh, that's love a good that. one. Yep. Love Dap it. them up. Yeah. Drop a pin. I love so it. So make sure you check that out. All right. So it'll be fun. I'm excited for you. I love it. I can't wait to listen. Yeah. I'm excited too. All right. Okay. Let's get into it. Let's get into it. Weather. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's a whole thing. That fucking thing. It's a whole thing. I'll tell you what. It is. But obviously, (laughs) it's been pretty much the top story in the news right now in many different fronts because of Hurricane Helene that came through the other week. And now this next hurricane that's coming through. What's the name of this one again? I just did a whole Milton. Milton Tough. Um, Milton is coming towards Florida. Was a category five. It's category four now, which is still incredibly strong. But Basically, it's looking like absolute disaster is heading once again towards the country. So 
I wanted to get into it and how military bases are responding. I have some stories about Fort Eisenhower after Hurricane Helene, a real poopy story. A lot okay. of a poop heavy story. Yeah, get back to our roots. Coming out of Fort Eisenhower um, and just how different military bases handle these kind of things. But first, I have three different times weather affected the outcome of a war. Oh, let's get into it. Number one, cold. Mm. And I feel like as soon mm. as I say this one, this one is so infamous that you can pretty much guess what it is. Uh, Napoleon's invasion of Russia in 1812. He was looking to expand the French Empire and he was like, let's head up into Russia. We'll shit all over him. Wrap this up by fall. We'll get out of here. So him and his troops head on up into Russia and Russia keeps retreating. He's like, these pussies, look at these pussies. Sacre <laughs> <laughs> bleu, they keep retreating. Les petits fromages, they go to retreat. So <laughs> they continue chasing the Russians deeper into Russia. Napoleon, that was a trap. That was a trap, pal, because fall came and went. And by the time winter hit, his troops were so deep, there was nowhere they could go. They got stuck. More than 300,000 men died. And That's most of it so many. was due to cold. That's and not... double the current amount of people that yeah. are in the Marine Corps. Russia also lost around 200,000. So like even at their own game, they kind of, but 300,000 men, uh, it was a, a failure. It stopped his whole march across Europe. And when he came back, he got exiled to the island of Ni. Ibris. That was his oh. second exile. Oh, he okay. got, yeah. No. So anyway, um, sim similar thing, 1941. Guess what idiot did the same? He did. He pulled a Napoleon, went up into Russia, got bogged down in the winter and fucked that up. Dumb bitch Hitler. Yep. That dumb bitch <clears throat> Hitler. Dumb bitch Hitler alert. All right. So that was the cold fog. And this was a classic. This was like his primo move. George Washington was a huge fog guy. People don't realize that. Yeah. Revolutionary War early on August 1776. George Washington and 9000 of his troops had their back against the wall a.k.a. the East River in Brooklyn. Yeah. They're in this little peninsula, 9,000 troops in him, and they're completely surrounded in the rest of Brooklyn by the British. Then, in the middle of the night, a thick, thick-ass fog. I'm talking geez. fog. You could spread honey mustard oh, all over that fog. It, a it was a, give it a little burn. A big fog rolled in. Fog was mocking. Washington was like, <laughs> we're going to take advantage of this. They got all 9,000 in the thick of the fog across the East River, which by the way, like it's it's just like a tidal tributary, really, but the currents in that thing are crazy. Like I where mm -hmm. I live, like ships would go down. So like boats would still get sucked down by the anyway, it was a whole to do. He got all 9,000 across in the fog safely. Morning, sun comes up, fog burns off. The redcoats are like, let's go fuck their day up. They come rushing in. Poof. Washington was gone. He was over in Manhattan with 9,000 of his buddies waving from the other side saying, hey, dum-dums. Oh, man, they hey, look idiots. like such cucks. I know, such cucks. I mean, he did it That's... again. Cri yeah, Christmas, Christmas. In the middle of the night. He crossed the Delaware. Big fog guy. Big fog yeah. guy. Huge yeah, I like, he talked about the fog of war all the time. This one, this is the only one I didn't know. Tornado. Oh, Helen Hunt, the Battle of Helen Hunt. The Battle of Helen Hunt in that yeah. see-through white t-shirt. Uh -huh. After, after that cat five on that the That shit got me going when I was young. Also, how old do you think Helen Hunt was in, in that movie? Oh, I love this game. Uh, 37. No, 33. Look it I up. I think Con. she was 34. I think she was 34. Twister Way was in 96. And the Helen breakfast Hunt. in that movie that the ant makes for them is like my oh, death row meal. Yeah. The steak yeah, and yeah, eggs. And... Yeah, she was 33. Good job, Kate. Oh, wow. Kate, okay. mm -hmm. way to go. Did she study that? Yeah, no, yeah. I didn't. Damn. But I fucking Something about movie. the 90s. Women always looked older. I don't know. That is true. Yeah. Well, we didn't have all the filler and the and the tighteners. And oh, the are you guys familiar with Pillow Face? Yes. Wait, what's pillow that? Pillow Face is scary. It's Wait, wait, all... wait. So for the last like 10 years with Reckless Abandon, women have been getting fillers. It's been yeah. working out great. But because it's brand new, we didn't know what would happen down the line. The filler migrates. And never dissolves. Never dissolves. And so, like, Chrissy Teigen is a great example. Oh, she's got it. Yeah. Holy shit. It's uh, like Michelle huge, Pfeiffer. Giant. It, like, for, it migrates into the cheeks and creates these, like, giant pillows. Every there. woman on Real Housewives of oh, Salt Lake City. Yeah. 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 Yep. yeah. It's tough. Well, we didn't listen, know. if you are willing to just shoot plastic into your face that is a foreign substance to your body, I think you kind of get what you deserve. Oh, wow. Yeah. I will say this. I would like my neck waddle removed and I would like just the ponytail facelift just where it looks like I'm wearing a tight ponytail just a little bit. Anyways, okay. <laughs> tornado. 
This is the last one. Yeah. <laughs> War of 1812. Uh huh. Britain said, we didn't get enough of a whooping during the Revolutionary War. We want to get spanked again. We're, dirty, it, little, again, red, we're dirty little British boys. And we want Bring to get your a little fog over here again. again, daddy. So here they are. They invade Washington, D.C., known as Washington City at the time. British soldiers are torching everything. They're going through all the government buildings, houses, everything. The White House, the Capitol. They were like, we're going Jan 6th on everybody's ass. We're climbing the walls. We're burning the <laughs> shit what down. That's they said. That is. Uh, First Lady Dolly Madison, she famously, White House is on fire. She saves a portrait of George, the famous portrait of George Washington. The First Lady herself saves and that right And you got to think wall. that that, it was only like 40 years old at that time. Probably yeah. like 30. The painting was probably only like 30 years old. Not that important. She, I remember one of her, we just put down new Perco flooring right. in here. She yeah. was so she, upset. Oh, she yeah. was the so video upset. of that is crazy. Yep, it was Wild a nice viral. white oak, uh, faux white oak. Mm. Anyways, um, White House and like they burned, they were burning down everything when all of a sudden, that's a tornado siren that didn't exist at the time. (laughs) Tornado rolls through. Invented by Benjamin Franklin. Severe thunderstorm, at least one tornado. The rain was so intense, it put out all the flames that the British had was burning everything. The rain put out all the flames. The tornado like was a direct hit on British troops. And the weather in that 26 hour span between when they came to D.C. and like fucked it up, the weather killed more British troops than any Americans did. Yeah. One of the congressmen yeah. tweeted that it was actually the Democrats that were controlling the weather. Yep. That was <laughs> that, uh-huh. it to happen. that was James Madison, actually. That did <laughs> oh, that. Was I think it, it was uh, all to do. <laughs> Anyways, less than 26 hours later, they were wet. They had swamp ass. They were like, we're out of here. We didn't enjoy that spanking as much as we thought we would. We're all soggy. I love when you do voices like that. Yeah. Actually imagine James Madison doing that with his face. Oh, we're all, oh, we're out of here. Get out of here, you little <laughs> soggy <laughs> boys. You're like your little soggy Britain. Soggy bottom. You're I thought, didn't know we're back in foggy London now. Mm-hmm. Anyways, fog, tornado. Uh, there's uh, the Spanish one time busted a whole other shipping platoon because of the wind and fire. It's interesting. The, the effect that weather, uh, where we dropped the atomic bomb, we were going to drop it somewhere else that could have had a totally different effect. And the weather wasn't great there. And so we were like, let's fuck up this. And it was event. really hot right after it was dropped. Too. It was. Yeah. Spiking yeah. temperatures there. There's a know? whole part of uh, artillery school. where We have to learn about the weather because of how much that affects the projectiles when you're firing. Oh, yeah. How much it affects the conversation around the artillery gun. Mm. Looking cloudy today, Tom. <laughs> Yep. <laughs> okay, I guess I'll pull the string. Okay, you have to be wet, cold, or hot. Rank those. Hot. I'll take hot all day. La- and war? Yeah. Give, yeah, give me hot. Yeah. Give me hot, then give me cold, then give me wet. Yeah, that order. I think I would flip those. I'd rather be cold than hot. No Because you can way. run around no and way. move around and, and, and get that body heat going. No and way. You're, okay. you're miserable when you're just sitting. The worst nights of my time in service were when I was cold. Yeah. What, like um, being stuck. You're just sitting post. There. But that's a vast majority of combat is sitting. Yeah. Just sitting in true. the cold. Yeah. Fuck that. Hey, I don't know what I was listening to, but I heard, I learned a fun fact the other day in terms of being uh, warm and heat. Did you know the Mall of America doesn't heat the mall? They Because there's so much body heat being yeah, produced by all the people. They don't have to pay for heat. Damn. It's just one really big guy. That yeah. Keeps riding the, yeah. Keeps Probably riding. just a bunch of dads. Probably just a bunch <laughs> of dads. That's why they have the benches outside the store. <laughs> the so mall the is dad powered. Because they're out there to breathe. Hell yeah. Yeah. No, I didn't know that. That's fascinating. All right. Now, on to her. But we'll get into the main stories in a minute here. But you know me. I had some more hurricane facts. Right okay, there. good. Because I am down a rabbit hole on this one. They were talking about this storm that's coming, Milton. The pressure on the inside is the fifth craziest atmospheric drop that there's ever been in the history of all what like Yeah, the one guy from the from Miami. He was like a meteorologist from Miami that'd been there for like 40 years. He got a case of the weepies on. He there. started crying when he was talking oh, about it. So man. I went down a rabbit hole on how crazy this this storm is. Quick hurricane facts. Did you know when would you say the first cause you see the the military planes that fly into the hurricanes? Mm-hmm. When was the first time you think we did that? Well, you can I'm going to say it's yeah, we can see. Not, so not I'm going to guess 1912. No a later. OK, well, considering we only started flying in 1903, the 1912 might be difficult. Uh, it's on I'm the gonna, sheet. I'm trying to. Have I'm not looking at the sheet. But... I'm not, not cheating. Looking. I'm not cheating. I'm not looking at the sheet. I only got one screen to work with today. I'm going to say 1979. 1943 during World War Two. Oh, wow. And can you imagine that? Like 
1943 plane technology and then being like, okay, you guys have a special mission today. So I mean, the people in 1943, you've only had planes going for 30 years yeah. at that point. And we're talking like from what we masters of the air and this. Yeah. The people in the 40s must have had iron stomach. Crazy. Yeah. My grandpa was a flight instructor in the Army Air Corps. And they lost more people just training than they did in the war. Like, it was crazy how many people they lost, like, because of the planes. Whatever. Anyway, yeah, that had to be tough to be the first one tasked to go into a hurricane. <laughs> like, you're going to go find you a hurricane. We're going to do what now? <laughs> what? Wait, what? You, I mean, 1943, you you haven't seen a radar that, that what no. it looks like, how be- big it is. This thing now, the one that's in there now, is almost the entirety of the fucking gulf of mexico yep it's huge so large. i bet a post hurricane flight cigarette is so good you land you get up to oh, right in the eye or like a mid hurricane nut yep oh for sure i'm sure yeah. they're it up there oh, anyway yeah. um we routinely <laughs> fly planes and autonomous drones into these storms for research i guess that's part of where people get the idea that we're creating them they're flying the drones and they're dropping the uh, water bombs that make them bigger Anyways, now we've never you know me I yeah. don't like to do a whole lot of making fun on based on regional diction and the way people say things. Yeah. <laughs> the way that you say storm is insane. Storm. Where, storm. Where, where does that? You're adding letters into yeah. that word that don't exist. Storm. You're, storm. There's no U in the word. It's a one syllable word. Storm. Yeah, you're, you're, you're adding a U and an M. You're adding a syllable. Speaking of hurricane eye, you guys are gonna get a black eye if you keep oh, shit. <laughs> Store them. Get out of here. Okay, here's an interesting Store fact. <laughs> Hurricanes, obviously, they shift the land and the winds, blah, blah. They routinely unearth shipwrecks. I just a couple years ago in Florida, yeah. a major, cool. like an old timey, like piratey ship, wooden ship was unearthed, and people were like, holy shit. Um, and all kinds of crazy shit washes ashore. Hurricane season in the Atlantic goes from June to November, but hurricanes have occurred every single month of the year except February. Mm. I didn't know that. The most tornadoes spawned by one single tropical cyclone was Hurricane Ivan, 120 twisters in 2013. Whoa. So it's not just a hurricane. It's like a twister factory sometimes inside of them. Uh, looking at the damage from Helene on the hills of North Carolina and like the paths of, tra- I'm like, there had to have been just hurt, like twisters everywhere. Uh, according to the University of Utah, a large hurricane releases the energy of 10 atomic bombs every second. The heat Jeez. generated by the average hurricane is the equivalent to 10 megaton nuclear bomb exploding every 20 minutes. That's how much crazy energy. And they said this one was hitting its limit for how much water it could soak. Yeah, that's why the absorb. guy was crying yesterday. Yeah. He was like, it, if you had mathematical equations and I was teaching a course on what's the worst case scenario, this storm is the worst is case. the worst scenario. case. So hopefully it weakens a ton. But anyway, um, this comes to us from Jeff Skogel. I always fuck up his name at Task and Purpose. Um, he's been on a heater lately, by the way. I would mm-hmm. like to see more episodes of Between Two Hescos. Um, as a second major hurricane barrels toward the south, the Pentagon has been tasked with pre-staging high water vehicles and helicopters for search and rescue and transporting relief supplies and troops in central Florida after Hurricane Milton. I imagine the logistic bubbas, especially those with a little dash autism, are like <laughs> are like that that meme of the so uncle peeking cool. out from behind the tree. They're like, oh, yes, here we go. This is my time to shine. This is like a logistic Bubba's dream to prepare for this shit. Or sister. Thank you. Or sister. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The preparations come as close to 10,000 soldiers and other service members are deployed to relief efforts of Hurricane Helene in Western North Carolina, Tennessee, and elsewhere in the storm's path. Over 10,000 troops uh, right now already helping clean up that storm. Milton became a Cat 5, the strongest type on Monday, but is less into a Cat 4, still incredibly powerful. Based on its current path, it looks like Tampa, which is home to McDill Air Force Base, is going to take the brunt of that storm. That's for CENTCOM, right? C- yes, yeah. and that's yes, for US, Cent- US Central Command. JSOC. Yeah. Yep. SOCOM. And so I'm guessing, yep. too, they're getting all the planes out of there. They're getting, like, anything and everything that they can getting the fuck out of there. A mandatory evacuation of the base was well underway on Monday. It seems they've got a much better hold on this situation than what they had over at Fort Eisenhower, Georgia, when Hurricane Helene rolled through. Um, and I want to get into that real quick. Hurricane or Fort Eisenhower, Georgia is home to Cyber Command, many MOS schools and other training schools. So you have a lot of brand new young troops like barracks just packed with new boots. OK, mm-hmm. so 
here's there's a couple posts here that I'm going to summarize, but here's some posts from soldiers who are actually on Fort Eisenhower after Helene rolled through. Uh, the base lost power and running water. Only the hospital and specialty buildings have backup. No commissary, no chow halls, just MREs and a water buffalo. Privates lined up at food trucks because it's the only real food they can get besides MREs. Permanent party folks told to evacuate. Um, his A buddy of mine's cadre popped smoke and didn't ensure all students had gas or even places to go. So like some of the leadership just dipped and left their students hanging. Not That's hard sure. for me to believe. Well, I, I read many other reports from there of this happening. And I read, I saw where some journalists were reaching out and Fort Eisenhower, like PR was like just hanging up on them. Like apparently a bit Eesh. of a shit show. As soon as power was lost, they should have cut everyone loose, but they kept them until running water stopped and then took six hours to finally let people leave. I saw posts. That seems troops, more realistic. I saw posts during the storm of troops still stuck at work being as like the parking lots are flooding, being like, because everybody's go scared now? to make a decision. Yep. Mm. Like I, I mean, that is a tale as old as time. Like you have somebody mm. like, dude, you're a battalion commander. Just make a fucking decision. Right. Just make a decision, dude. And, and even if it's the wrong one, say it was the wrong one. Yep. Sorry, I let them all go, but I'd rather be safe than sorry. Right. Um, they boast so much about being the cyber center of excellence and how much money is dumped into the post, yet they couldn't afford basic 10K generators. They've handled this hurricane like hot garbage, zero planning, zero accountability. Um, and like they said, yeah, no generators. No, there was no plan for an area that could be hit by hurricanes. There was no plan for a ton of students. Mm -hmm. um, somebody else was talking about. Um, Garrison having zero idea what was going on. How are people supposed to take care of their families when there's a constant back and forth on the plan this week? So they're saying, I was reading this all over, like leadership just did not know what was going on and people were just waiting for word and not getting it. Um, and then How this often one. does Fort Eisenhower, sorry, deal with hurricanes in that part of Georgia? Not Augusta? <laughs> Decently often. I mean, because well, the Augusta is only Augusta is only like 110, 15 miles north of Jacksonville, like mm -hmm. going up the coastline. So there it's not too, too far away. Like Augusta is about 45 minutes north of uh, Savannah, Georgia. So well, that's was, not it's not too far. I was reading, too, that Fort Eisenhower is supposed to be the go to spot for the coastal bases in that area in case of a hurricane. So it's they inland, should be but it's not, it's not like. It is inland, but it's not crazy inland. Like they would have effects from hurricanes for sure. Okay. And then this last one, the, we're, we're getting to the poop of it all now. Okay. Picture a mega barracks complex with six to 800 students in it. Okay. Mm -hmm. The electricity goes out. The water goes out. Six to 800 students. They get after they waited for 24 hours. They finally got one porta potty hell yeah one porta potty Ooh. and here's the post as some of you may know fort eisenhower was hit by a hurricane power was out for a few days and water went out shortly after i am an ait student here and live in a barracks which houses six to eight hundred other students what's ait in, in army infantry? initial training okay okay to put it simply disaster response was horrendous huge shout out to this enlisted troop knowing these words horrendous. yeah good <laughs> <laughs> um, no defect, but we were given MREs, so we were fed at least. And I'm like, I'm reading that. I'm like, them's the breaks. Okay, yeah. your MREs, you'll survive. Like, that's going to the field too. Like, okay. Um, barracks, hot and dark. After went after the power went out, it took a whole day to get porta potties at the barracks, and it was only a single porta potty for the entire barracks. As you can imagine, the bathroom situation was horrible. So students used their bathrooms inside the barracks with no plumbing. Shit, piss, the barracks started to smell. After three days of this, of one porta potty for six to eight hundred students, um, after three days, we finally got ten porta potties to use. We were told we had to remove any shit that was in our toilets to have plumbing returned, and we couldn't go to bed until this was done. As you can imagine, the barracks smelled horrendous as people literally scooped shit into bags or any other container to take it to a dumpster with some of the bags leaking into the hallways. This this leadership is the definition yeah. of good initiative, bad yeah. judgment. After mm. about an hour of that, we were told we also had to remove the piss along with any liquid in the toilet. Okay. Nearly midnight and the barracks has to wait for inspection of our toilets. I'm kind of shocked this is something we have to do as we're getting introduced to the army, <laughs> blah, blah, blah. Can't even get drinking water because the tank goes empty. They're saying the... 
the water, as soon as a new water buffalo comes, there's so many thirsty people that there's still a long line of thirsty people once the water buffalo is empty, like not enough water. Um, we've Wait, been told how many water buffaloes have a shit ton of water in them. Yep. That's how, yeah, I but not, that's how bad. not enough for 800 people. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. That's a lot of people. Anyways, um, we've been told soldiers deal with a lot of, a lot worse. You don't have half the stuff now you have on deployments. So I've heard enough of that, but it's not a deployment, but I fared quite well. <laughs> up. You're, you're in Georgia. And they're saying like, I get that. And I fared quite well up until I had to scoop crap into a bag. And I hope I don't run into that later in my career. And they pro they provided proof. Um, he, like some of the group chats, this is from leadership. P piss needs to be removed as well. Scoop it by any means necessary and dispose of it. But like, they don't, I like this one on it. this one. Cause the <laughs> screenshot that Kate showed, it just says at everyone, yep. <laughs> like everyone needs piss to be removed mm -hmm. at, if you plunge it, it should allow to flush enough for it to be clear. Everything needs to be out of the toilets, piss included per DS. What does that mean? How do you fucking get piss out? If you need tools, DS said like he has cups? Some scoops. That's they're providing scoops. Like this yeah. is that's crazy. You don't this need is... piss to come out to fix a toilet. Well, so that's what I was gonna say. I think so often in the military we're put in these positions where you're not qualified to make these sorts of decisions. I would say generally across the military, not everybody is an expert plumber. So you get tasked with emptying these toilets and this is what you end up with people just trying to come up with ideas that to your good initiative bad judgment you understand what has to happen but i don't even know where i would start if i had a barracks full of my platoon members and said empty your toilets i don't i know. would say common sense should be don't put <laughs> more well, piss and shit in a dumpster yeah like <laughs> I, I, yeah. I feel like with the plumbing situation it doesn't take fucking Mario and Luigi to be like, I, I think <laughs> any type of liquid would be fine. Like it, it's Crazy. liquid. Crazy. Mm -hmm. Like I understand solids, even like you don't have to remove poop for plum for the plumbing to begin to work. It's a mystery. I don't know. I also read now I wouldn't recommend getting everybody on radio and being like, all right, everybody put those dick skinners right on that flush <laughs> flusher right damn now. And then doing everybody a mass flush at one time. I don't think that would work. No. But piss. You yeah. could flush with piss. Just seems like a disaster. The part that really was upsetting was troops leadership popping smoke and not making sure the junior enlisted like That's crazy. had a place to go That's or their crazy. families were okay. Twenty seven homes got really fucked up. Um I read I was reading that there were casualties, no one was killed. Um, but apparently still, even as of last Friday, still a dumpster fire there. Cause I did, I like looked into all these claims and it looks like truly a shit show. Yeah. And when I used to be a instructor at a schoolhouse and you know that you're not leaving until every single one of your students is accounted for and that they're where they're supposed to be. I mean, we had natural disasters. I mean, not on this scale, obviously, right. but we had like a huge ice storm came through Texas whenever I was there. So everything was shut down. You, my kids were leaving school. My wife was at home. I'm not, I wasn't allowed to leave until all my Marines were accounted yep. for. Yeah. That's crazy. Or not necessarily not allowed to. I, you don't like <laughs> that's right. what you do. That's just what you do. Um, a 2021 DOD study found that most of our military bases are at significant risk to climate hazards. Um, especially it's on track to become more prevalent by the end of the century. That's why the, the Joint Chief said that the number one national security threat is global warming. Yeah, and this between 2017 or and- climate change, whatever way. You whatever say. way you wanna say it. Between 2017 and 2021, more than $13 billion worth of damage was caused by bases hit around the globe. This includes 2018, when half of the structures at Tyndall Air Force Base in Florida were destroyed by Hurricane Mitchell, causing at least five billion in damages. A and lot I, of those are the F thirty fives. Remember? Yep, like I remember we covering about that. that and being yep. like, "Why don't they just fly?" And then yeah. we—that's how we figured out that a lot of them don't fly. Yep, mm -hmm. which seems to be a problem. Then like, put them on the back of a truck and get them out of here. Right. Um, most significantly, the Marine Corps' iconic Paris Island Training Depot may need to relocate as flooding and storms threaten to swallow the base in the coming decades. I could see and that so, for sure. Like the oh. swampland that's already there. It's already barely above water as is. Yeah, but, there's uh, snakes and alligators. You got to be careful there. So back to Helene was over a week ago now, but it's still huge in the news because there's just so much. I mean, the the recovery from this is going to take 
a long, long time, but already mm-hmm. incredible strides have been made. There's so many incredible stories coming out of this. Um, but here's a quick story to explain what's making it way more difficult. There is a, as per usual, a swirl of misinformation, but it's hitting yeah. particularly hard because it's hitting areas that have limited cell service. So people are getting crazy information and then blackout, nothing. So they're left with this crazy info and nothing to yada yada. So one day after Helene slammed into Asheville, North Carolina, leading to seven trees falling on her house, destroying her roof, Nicole McNeil read an alarming article warning that a second storm was barreling towards the area. She had a panic attack, her anxiety spiking, her heart pounding. She didn't have enough gasoline to evacuate another disaster, but it was all a hoax. Across the Southeast, false rumors and conspiracy theories are flying about Helene, which made landfall about a week ago, causing 229 deaths in six states. The misinformation is adding to the chaos and confusion, especially in rural areas that lack power and cell service, where locals are relying on word mouth, like mouth to mouth, like mm-hmm. just mouth to mouth. Lance Corporal Undergroom, <laughs> mouth to mouth. They're not relying on mouth to mouth. You guys hear about no this story right now? Yeah, that. You got, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We got that big storm coming. <laughs> uh, another example, a few other examples. There was a fake news flash about a dam breaking in Western North Carolina, causing hundreds of people and first responders to flee. And this holds up responses. This holds up people getting found. This holds up all kinds of stuff. Turned out to be totally fake. In Eastern Tennessee, a rumor went out that feds were seizing and bulldozing Chimney Rocks Town Hall with bodies still in the rubble sending people into a tizzy and this puts people's lives in danger. Yeah. Like genuinely in a heavily armed area, like you don't want to be coming up with lies like this. Um, There's tons of rumors like disaster relief money is being funneled to the migrants. Mark Robinson, the who's running for governor of North Carolina, he's telling people there's been no government response at all. And I think the most selfish thing you can do during a time like this is Mm -hmm. say, fuck the people. I'm going to use this for my own political gain, even though I know it's going to hurt people Mm, like my own Mm. people um senator kevin corbin a republican slammed the rampant misinformation thursday in a facebook post wait the mark robinson thing's crazy too because that motherfucker is the current lieutenant governor yeah like in that state and he's saying what do you mean there's no well lieutenant governor fucking do something if that's the case right Um, and even on both sides um there's republicans saying like cut it out this is hurting us more than it's helping us um, Republican Senator Kevin Corbin slammed his own colleagues on a Facebook post on Thursday. I was reading too. It's interesting. Human psychology helps explain why all this, this misinformation and fake claims and fake stories gain traction because in times of crisis, like that shit was so crazy. You cannot make sense of it. Mm-hmm. Like it's so chaotic and you cannot believe this happened to you. And the truth is so painful and so hard to bear that you just look desperately elsewhere for any other reason it could have happened. So you start to believe narratives that would never pass a basic fact checked in your regular everyday life. You are way more prone to believing shit. You're way more vulnerable when stuff like this happens. Um, FEMA has even had to update. They have a webpage now where you can seek to dispute. You can look, they're like keeping up with the rumors. They have a webpage where you can go, here's all the rumors. Here's like actual fact checked articles to show you. Somebody in the heat of all this, somebody that has dedicated funds coming from a salary for FEMA, had to spend their time creating this website because, and I mean, let's be honest here. The Republicans are doing it. Like this is by and large, Marjorie Taylor Greene. You have Trump that was saying it. You have um, the fucking Lieutenant governor that was saying it that, I mean, Marjorie Taylor Greene saying that the government is controlling it to an attempt to have Republicans be ostracized in Western North Carolina and not be able to vote. It's a democratic principle. This shit is crazy, man. Like it is their people that are doing it. It's the Republicans that are doing it. And I don't under, like maybe there's one out of every 10 is doing it as a Democrat, but phrasing it as a both sides, which a lot of the mainstream media is doing is, is ridiculous. Yeah. And uh, cause it's not, as I said, like that Republican, um, Senator, he's not the only Republican calling it out and saying this is fucked up. Like it's, it's Mm -hmm. even Republicans are getting frustrated with the Marjorie Taylor greens. They're saying like, quit muddling in my fucking state while we're trying to help people. Right. It's making me crazy. Brian Kemp, the governor of Georgia, doing the same thing. Like he's, yeah. he's out there calling it out. But there is definitely Republicans that are saying stop it. But the primary actors of doing this are Republican fi- officials. Yeah, people using it for political gain. Um, North Carolina Department of Public Safety has had to do the same. 
And they're writing that authorities are working around the clock to save lives and provide humanitarian relief. Relief. Um, FEMA also said in a news release that federal aid has provided 110 million so far. More than 700 of its staff are on the ground in North Carolina. 1,200 search and rescue plus 10,000 troops. They're adding another 500 additional troops. Um, and I wanted to give a special shout out to, I was reading stories about troops whose own homes were destroyed um, and troops who family members hurt and all kinds of stuff. And they still showed up and reported to duty. Like I can't imagine looking at my home and having lost everything and then getting in my car and going to help other people. Like yeah. just so impressive. And, and there's certain, I mean, last year or when we first moved in, I've talked about a bunch of times that my house was flooded. Like my, mm -hmm. when I first bought the house and even I didn't have anything in it. I had never lived in that house a day. Like I had just had it and going in there and seeing like the water, how much was in there, how much it affected my house. It was overwhelming. Like mm -hmm. just in that. I saw TikToks of people, videos of people explaining what to do like for their own homes and what they had to do. And one woman, she was probably 50, early 50s, and she was standing in her basement and she was like, well, we figured out the easiest way to get it, everything under control. It's going to make it a lot easier is that, um, well, let me just walk you through. And she had to take down every single piece of drywall in her home. Every single piece of furniture was out like on the road. And she was like, this looks really bad. But she's like, this is how we rebuild. And I've had to like come to this spot in my brain where I'm like, this is I have to do this in order to move forward. So I'm looking at it like I didn't die here. So it's an opportunity for me to go forward she, because she wasn't home. She said the way that the water hit in her home and the way that from the side that it was coming, like her front door, the water was rushing in and hitting up against the front door, like pushing it that way from the water that was coming down mm -hmm. a hill. She was like, I wouldn't have been able to get out of the back because the water was rushing in through the window so much. And I wouldn't have been able to open any of the front doors to get out. So yeah. I would have drowned in my own home. Like it's if terrific. I was crazy, and yeah. it's crazy. Too, we're, we're also right. dealing with people who have PTSD right now who oh, are, yeah. who witnessed horrific things and shit. Like it was of biblical proportions. And this brings like to a lot of people said, I was reading um, people in the Asheville area where like the firefighters came and told us we didn't have to evacuate. So we should be good. And then two hours later, it's like, the warn we still have so much work to do on warning think you'd systems be flooded in the mountains yep right um, well so that brings me to a lot of these <laughs> homes are built on sloped land mm -hmm. and tourism booming there airbnb like a lot of homes being built on these slopes and i watched a really interesting i made you guys watch it too but this news report about the North Carolina home builders lobby and this is like a billion dollar and this is like one of the big big ass fucking lobbies and every year they introduce legislation, they buy politicians and they introduce legislation to because safe building codes, slope safe building codes, flood safe building codes, all that shit that you add costs them money. They have to spend more yep. time and more money and their greedy asses don't want to do it. And so they have fought so hard for years and years and years and it's being called out now. Um, and it was Republican and also there were Democrats who they bought the vote. Um, and basically a lot of the issues that have happened with the homes on the slopes and in the flood zones and the infrastructure, these were all things that they, that good politicians and people who give a fuck tried to fix. And they said, no, 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 no. Like they, they voted it away. And also FEMA is like for the States who do meet these safe building standards, you get more FEMA money. North Carolina voted away $70 million worth of FEMA money because of this home builders lobby who didn't mm -hmm. want to do things the right way. And now we're seeing what happens when you don't have safe slope well, building. What happens right. when you don't have flood safe building? Like, And you're seeing human nature take over, both with the politicians who are using this natural disaster as a way to bolster their own platforms and, you know, talk negatively about their opponents, which is disgusting. And then in this example, people are willing to roll the dice, right? Because I'd rather put money in my own pocket than maybe there's a once in a lifetime type weather uh, pattern that comes through or natural disaster that comes through so that they, they weigh everything. And they're like, well, I could worry about everybody and try to stay up to code 
or I can make millions of dollars through my construction company, through my contracting company. And I think ultimately, unfortunately, human nature plays out because people look out for themselves more so than they're going to look out for their, their well, just gre human. greed at the top of the, of this lobby. Really? It's, it's like just crazy greed. Well, and and I, th you're right. It's greed. But I think at the end of the day, people rationalize it in their head. They're like, all right, if I push back and I pay off politicians and we keep these codes at bay, I can make a lot of money on the flip side. If we get a crazy hurricane, a lot of buildings could be destroyed. People could be injured or worse well, killed. What are the chances of that happening? Ah, it's a small percentage. Okay, I'm going to make that money. But it's greed because they know that yeah. it's not really That's a what chance. I'm saying. It's, no, no, it's no, going to no, no. happen. And like, well, the, but the, you rationalize it. I think, yeah, I yeah, think what Con, is, Con's just saying, you rationalize that yes. for your own personal gain. Yeah, Where right. if you were asking outside of a monetary and there was no monetary benefit for you, you obviously vote yes. for these codes. But since you can get a kickback in some way, you're taking that. Hence, and they already have the right. so much money. It's crazy to me. But I would say, like, look into the North Carolina Home Builders Lobby and, like, look up some of the articles about it and the politicians that they've bought. Same thing with homeowners insurance, too. And and there's engineers. And there's there was a woman in this who's a politician who she's a lawyer for, like, home builders. And she's like, even I couldn't vote in their interest because the the safety they're asking us to put aside is so insane. I couldn't, I like, couldn't vote for it. Like, oh. it's crazy. Whatever, whoever you're voting for, if you're in an area affected by stuff like this, like look into it and demand your politicians answer for this shit. Like they could sure use that $70 million of FEMA money. Or why as a whole, there was 130 <laughs> that voted against extra FEMA money this year. Yeah. Like to be allocated directly to FEMA because there, I read an article, I think it was in the Washington post this morning. Do you guys know since, 2000 this is the 1300th year storm that's on record since the year 2000 that Wait, would classify that this is the 13th time since the year 2000 that a uh, 100 year storm has happened oh like, like a, a once in a hundred that, years type yeah. storm level yeah that makes it and it's happened seven times in the last five years and it about to happen twice in two weeks yeah it's crazy because that's the when that last night when it dropped below 900 MBs of pressure, it was mm -hmm. only the fourth time ever that that's happened. And it was about 10 miles an hour off from being the strongest hurricane ever recorded. I saw a great there was tweet a that max was like, gust 230 miles an hour. I saw a great tweet. There's like, can you imagine being a shark that just leaps out of the water for a second? You're like, whoa, what the <laughs> fuck? What's happening right now? That is, that is what they sound like. Oh, another yeah. hurricane fact. Did you know that sometimes birds get stuck in the eye of the storm? And they're like, what? Storm? The fuck, dude. And they keep <laughs> like, trying to get out. Thing? And they can't. And so they like just keep rolling inside the middle of the storm until it finally fizzles out. And they're like, I'm sorry. I can't get over how now that Chaps has pointed out that you made that a two-syllable <laughs> word. Storm? Yeah. Storm. Storm. That's your favorite Storm. Mar that's your favorite superhero. Who's your favorite? Storm. Storm. Get the fuck Storm. out of here. Anyway, I just thought that was like super cuz I guess I didn't think about, you know, I'm watching the de devastation in North Carolina and elsewhere and like I didn't think about how politics plays into it that way. Mm. And especially now watching all the politicians point fingers and and who done it and how could this blah 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 and it's like it was you guys. Like you helped create this problem. This was mm -hmm. big part you. It's hot like the, dog. It's hot dog. Hot, it's like yeah. the arsonist who's watching the fire, and it's like, can you believe that that house yeah, is on is fire? Oh my god! Here? Wow. Yeah. Uh, but just really crazy. That's Paul and Marjorie Taylor Greene. She's having a, a time of her life. She's on a heater. She's on a heater right now. I take can't quakes. look away. She's got a lot of take quakes, and I'm I'm just, I can't stop watching. So, She's uh, the person whenever she opens her mouth that reminds me. Man, really anybody can get themselves elected to Congress because yeah. the shit that comes out of that woman's mouth is a level of brain dead that I didn't know could exist. But more than 50% of people in her district vote for. Yeah, I know. Fuck it. How do you look at those people like Matt Gates too? That's where like my wife is from, Matt Gates. How do you look at these people and be like, yep, that's the best we got. Ain't that <laughs> entire district? 
She People look guy. at it and they're like, Matt Gates, hell yeah. George Santos, hell yeah. Need that. Marjorie mm-hmm. Taylor Greene, fuck yeah. She had a big post about raw milk the other day. She had a big old jar. Making of- us healthy again. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> There's a reason why we started pasteurizing because people were fucking dying, Marjorie. Yeah, a lot of kids are going to suffer. That sucks. But uh, anyway, that's the weather for you. I'm that just- is the weather. But it's not I'm all not- bad. Um, If you, well, I guess I shouldn't say it because we don't know. We're doing this before the hurricane comes out. But some of my personal favorite time that I ever had growing up was playing wiffle ball in the eye of a hurricane. Happened uh, when I was in St. Augustine. I, we had, we like rented out a condo. My grandmother did. And like my dad, and his brothers and sisters, and all our family went and stayed at the condo. And then in between when the eye had gone over, um, we went out there and played a quick little game of wiffle ball that's so it was cool. like a category that's one wild. or two hurricane and we went out and played in the middle and it was the pitches that you could do with the world sw- the wind swirling like yeah. that was <laughs> yeah. crazy but being in the eye of the hurricane if you've never done it it is so bizarre because it's going from like the world's worst thunderstorm yeah. and then a second later it's completely blue skies like you can see the sun everything is normal and then you see the other side of the wall coming and you're just like, holy Fuck. shit. And they say the back side of the wall is the worst, right? Because yeah. it's just, yeah. Well, depending. Yeah. Because it's like getting dragged across. But that was really fun. Good hurricane. And then typhoons in Okinawa are the same thing. Wouldn't you guys hurricane. like put soap on the floors and like body surf across the. Yeah. We would do all kinds of shit at the kennels because you had to take care of the dogs. Like there are still yeah. 25 dogs out there that need to be taken care of. Didn't matter what the weather were. Like dog handlers, you're like on duty type of situation. But we would take the bottom side. So we have these varied kennels um, that the, the, the big kennels, I'm sure if you've seen any dogs going through like a German Shepherd going through an airport where it's the huge one. Well, it's flat on the side and there's on the bottom part. There's no air vents. It's yeah. just solid. So we would put that out into the grass and we got big tarps and made sails. Yeah. And there was so much water like on the ground that we would try to use sailboats like <laughs> around the kennel yard and go places. And we would get like boogie boards with sails and try to do like oh, kite yeah. surfing out there. <laughs> so if you're on duty this weekend and you're listening before you're on hurricane duty, it is your responsibility to keep the traditions of our beloved Marine Corps alive and go out there and do a little kite surfing, even if you will get in trouble and for a safety violation. Maybe don't. No, do it and send Maybe it. Don't. <laughs> send it. And then when you get caught, just say, no, 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 no. Chaps said I could. Yeah. Just yeah. give him that excuse. Be like, oh, actually, you can call my podcast in COIC and he'll. <laughs> yeah, he'll, he'll tell him to talk to you about it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Call my um, podcast. All right. Let's move on to some save rounds and alibis. Cons, we'll start with you. Ah, I missed you guys. Uh, yeah. It feels like forever. Um, Ireland was awesome. I would recommend it to. I wouldn't recommend it if you're under 30. I feel like it's an over 30 type trip, like with and get some like minded folks together and it will be an absolute enjoyable, amazing adventure. I want to shout out two things. Number one, we had this tour guide named Tom the one day we were driving through Connemara. You know, like when you go on a Wikipedia page and you're reading and then there's a hyperlink to something in the Wikipedia and it goes off to another part of Wikipedia. Yeah, that was this guy, Tom. I'm not kidding you. We were in the car, you know, on and off for six hours. He talked the entire time we were in the car. His knowledge of Ireland from every facet, whether it be trade, business, culture, it was super fascinating. He's like, oh, yeah, up this street. That's where um, Secretary uh, from your Veterans Affairs, Secretary McDonough, his parents have a house up here. He knew where everybody lived. It was very, very cool. And it was just such a beautiful country and such a great time. And then one thing that I think is a common misconception is that the food is no good in Ireland. That's just not the case. The food was basically unreal everywhere we went. I had some of maybe the best oysters I've ever had in my entire life while we were there. I had a a beer at Kate's family's bar in in the uh, village of, of Clifton there. Yeah, uh, which was duty balls bar. Ah, uh, the duty balls bar. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yes, yes. I've been there too. Um, it's a delight. Yeah, it's a no, fun. just um, really, really amazing, um, uh, fun time. And then, uh, the other thing I would like to mention, uh, because I haven't been around, so you guys haven't been talking about it, but we have some history 
Somebody Taking missed right now. constant and even listen to the beginning of the last episode because we did talk we about Army football and Army Navy football. football. But wait, wow. I want to hear your take on it. I and talk hear. shit about you, too. Yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> All right, I'm going to have to go back and listen. I usually listen, especially when I'm not on, just to make sure that you guys don't do exactly that. And talk yeah, shit so because we so. said we how much you haven't been on. That's I'll what be honest, so yeah. what is the history? They're both doing really well right now, right? Yeah, we're both 5-0 and for the first time since 1945 when I think we oh, finished shit. number one and number two in the country. It's just really exciting in this era of NIL and, and transfer portal. And everybody thinks like, well, you, you have to just build a team every year. And we are showing, uh, you know, Army and the, the boat school are showing people that, you know, culture can really take over and lead to good things happening. And then being you know, all, just if the, you leave after two years or three years, you just need a couple of, Pay back a couple hundred thousand dollars. Easy. Yeah, that's no big deal. Um, <laughs> and I think the other, you know, the cool thing um, on an individual level, you know, both quarterbacks are are having unreal seasons, so much so that that people are mentioning them uh, in the Heisman conversations, and it's a legitimate conversation based on the, the stats they're putting up. Uh, and certainly, you know, Army's quarterback, Bryson Daly, I love him. He's, he's just so tough and playing very well. But then – Perfect quarterback name. Yeah. Bryce and Daly. Come on. Yeah. The idea, and I listen, one game at a time, you don't want to get ahead of yourselves, but the idea that Army and Navy could have implications on the brand new 12 team playoff, who knows? One game at a time. We'll, we'll see how the rest of the season plays out. But it's just. He's avoiding saying it. If it Army Navy undefeated at the end of the year would be unbelievable. Don't you? I would way. say, I think, honest to God, now, look realistically if you had army and navy undefeated with the ability of one of those schools who have been much maligned been by and large bad like on college football scale for 40 50 years and then you have them both go undefeated for the last game the only game that's already a huge game i think that if army navy undefeated this year would be the biggest regular season college football game ever yeah I, I don't think, think it, that's I outside think, the realm of possibility. I think it would smash every, except for like a national championship, it would smash every other viewing record that there is. I think that the only games that would be bigger this year on TV would be the actual national championship game, the playoff games, and the Super Bowl. Other than that, yeah. I think, and you could probably bring in people who don't give a shit about the Super Bowl to watch it. I, I think it would be you, huge. It's one of those games for people who don't have any skin in the game either way. You just feel good watching it. It's fun to go like, to oh, anyway. Good. And this I one. and cons <laughs> knows I like to poo poo on it and all that. It is an unbelievable it's experience awesome. to go to yeah, if they are cool. undefeated with both of them having the ability to go. The quarterbacks could have a chance to go to the Heisman like performance, probably not win it, but a chance to go yeah. there to the Heisman ceremony. Both of them in there right after the election takes the place and like a spot. Yeah. To go I have a sneaky suspicion that this country is going to need some, some TLC after the election. Yeah, so yeah. that would be great to, to bond everybody together around. But, yeah, but cons, I, what, what if UT, UTSA has a chance to play spoiler? Cause that's, a, uh, yeah, that's the last game of the year. I have a question. For, except for army Navy, they close up with regular season with, UTSA. Not saying UTSA is not a tough customer to beat. Have both mm. of their schedules been relatively easy so far? Yeah, the no. com the conference is down pretty bad. Like across the board, the conference is down. Like it's not I, they're playing well and they're kicking yeah. the shit out of everybody. It's not yeah. like that's been close. Okay, but the schedule is not hard. Like okay. they haven't played anybody that's a tough team. All right. I mean, they're both they no ranked teams. Year, they haven't beat a ranked team. No, although was I think maybe Navy beat Memphis, which may or may not have been ranked at the time that they beat them. But uh, they both have to play Notre Dame, so they both have to get through Notre Dame to end yeah. up undefeated as well. Yeah, um, that would be so, amazing. I'll actually be rooting for them both. I want them. I want that to happen. It'd be great for the pot. It would yeah. be. I mean, not not that we want to get into the business of college football, but even before the we last make exceptions week for this transpired. The, just the get-in price for the Army Navy game. If you wanted a ticket, just to get in the door, the lowest ticket available was eight hundred dollars. We need to get our suite or whatever we're gonna do yeah. in order. Yeah, figure that out. Where is so, it? It's in DC this year, right? Yeah, it's yeah. in DC. So you're right, Collins. We need this. <laughs> we need it. Yeah. People, people have been hitting me up left and right. I, coming out of the woodwork, never been to Army Navy. Like, hey, uh, can you get tickets? I'm like, buddy. 
you and like 50 other people want tickets right now. It might be a, a tough ticket yeah. to get. So we'll see. Yeah, I'm going to text Dave when we're done, see if we're going to get a suite. <laughs> it's like exciting. Hey. Uh, anything else, cons? No, that's it. Katie? No, I don't think I have anything this week. I'm still trying to get my effing license and my plates from the DMV. And my, they keep telling me my mailing address is not real, and it is. Damn. So that's a hoot. And they won't send it anywhere other than your address. So I'm in quite the pickle cons. I'm about to drive to the state capital of Illinois today and demand. Oh, I'm going to storm the capital and demand my plates. What's the state capital of Illinois? I don't fucking know. Springfield. Spring, De, I was going to say De Plains. Just Plains. I refuse to learn too much about Illinois. I just, it's all flat. Yeah, it is. It bums me out a little. I love Chicago, though. Yeah. I guess yeah. that's all I got. All oh, right. I sorry. Have... Not okay, to be, ahead. sorry, not to be no. you know, the guy that I'm always, but AIT is actually advanced individual training, not army, whatever ah, you say. Thank initial. You. Okay. Yeah, you said that's initial. Said. Yeah, it's advanced individual training. It's the same, like, same thing. you were yeah. ju- you're directionally correct, because it's like teaching you your MOS. By yeah. the way, I saw a great point. Somebody was like, why the fuck? Would they put, because that Fort Eisenhower is like the Army's like technology center. It's like yeah. where all of our like, I don't want to say info wars. We're not making the frogs gay. We're just good. But it's like where all of our like internet warfare. Uh-huh. Is. It's like that's the hub. And people are like, why the fuck would you put that in the woods of Georgia and not like Silicon Valley or somewhere where. Because in that like spot, it has the most clear um, line of sight to most satellites in the world. Are you serious? Yeah. That's the reason why they selected that spot. Why because it's, it's in, I'm just kidding. I made that up. Oh. <laughs> that, <laughs> I, that, I was going along with it, man. That made perfect sense. To right. Me. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Shit. Um, I have three things. Okay. Well, wow. just two. Um, yeah, but it's because nobody cares about what books I read. So uh, I, get I to do. Talk. This I is do. my new army football cons in his books. <laughs> okay. Taps, I prefer, you know, I prefer nonfiction, but I like to know what you're reading. Well, so go ahead. Uh, one, one of these is nonfiction. First one okay. is called Tokyo Vice. It's an American reporter on the police beat in Japan. It's a guy who grew up in America, went to college in Japan, went to journalism school in Japan and became a Japanese journalist and has nothing to do with American, but he's a white guy that did it and got uh, put on the vice beat where they went to like the red light district in Tokyo. Mm -hmm. And he talks about his stories there. Fascinating book. Second one, it's a dystopian current. These are the books I read this week. Dystopian novel. It's called Tender is the Flesh. It's about if there was a huge virus amongst all animals and the animals got force killed everything because it was having like a pathogen that was killing uh, humans, then people get so used to having no protein that they eventually come up with a way to morally rationalize eating people and like coming up with like the different cut names. It's fascinating, um, the perspective there. And now I'm just started last night, but I'm like almost halfway done. John dies in the end. I really believe that this is a book. If I was going to write a fiction novel on like in the style that I used to blog all the time, this would be the book. It okay. makes me laugh out loud. John dies in the end. John By dies whom? in the end. Um, David Wong is okay. his name. And okay. I absolutely love the book so far. Chaps, but, how yeah. do you decide what's your process for picking out? All right, I'm going to read this next. Um, it used to be to hear how people pick books. It used to be a lot more involved because I didn't read that much. So I was like, if I'm going to pick out a book, I got to go through and pick out a fucking banger yeah. like where the reviews got to be like four or five. It's got to be the type of like writing that I like the type of protagonist. But now I just like, oh, that's kind of interesting. <laughs> so <laughs> cool premise. But I think it, which is kind of freeing because I don't have to find something that's going to be like incredible if I don't like it that much. Yeah. And, and three or four days, I'll start a new one. I ordered well, that bird. So I was, I was gonna be oh, special. yeah, I gave you that recommendation. Mm-hmm. I thought it was going to be. If, if you get into a book and you don't really like it, will you put it down? It depends. Um, if I have like if it was recommended to me by a friend or something, then I'll keep it going. But I have a 50 percent threshold threshold. Like okay, if I yeah, get okay. through. Depending on how much, like Count of Monte Cristo is like 1,800 pages. And there was several times. If I wasn't like 1,300 pages deep into Count of Monte Cristo, I'd have been donezo with that bad boy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't don't have it in me anymore. Yeah. But I did a check. I did uh, about three weeks ago. I did a six-month check since I've been reading um, every day a lot. And my memory scores went up 
12 points. Holy shit. Yeah, it's on a 100 point scale. My memory, okay. my, memory like a lot. my memory yeah. before was like around 50% and now it's gone up. Um, pretty significant, like in, really a, cool. in a year. Yeah, and it gives you new ideas, creativity, creatively around the office and yeah. all kinds of stuff. Yeah. I, I got to get back into it, man. I got to get back. Yeah. Um, so, oh, and me and Chief and Dave and Kate talked about finding what book. So we'll, next week I'll have the recommendation for what we're going to do in the next yeah. book club. Um, thanks for the response on the one with Teddy. That was great. And people are enjoying the book too. I've gotten a lot of messages that people have really enjoyed nice. the book too. Good.